Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for attending our session. My name is Carl. I'm the CEO of Strayer Education, a post-secondary institution. Been around 126 years this year, since 1892. Uh, also, just want to recognize Brian Jones, who's sitting right here in front of me. Wave, Brian. Brian's the president of the institution itself, former general counsel of the uh, Department of Education. Um, what I thought I could do is the best way uh, to give people a sense for Strayer and who we are, what we do, is just kind of walk you through some of the big initiatives we've had over the last uh, couple of years. And through that, hopefully you get a sense for kind of our management DNA, if you will. Everything that we do is designed to have an impact on our roughly 350 corporate clients, but also our 45,000 students. Um, we tend to be an organization that defines our success and the success of our students and uh, our corporate clients. We'll talk a little bit about that. And these are sort of eight brief but very specific uh, uh, initiatives that all had a major impact in our delivery of higher education. Um, starting with affordability. In late 2013, we arrived at a point of view that uh, we were guilty, honestly, of allowing the cost of our bachelor's degree in particular to become overpriced was our view. Um, and so through the combination of two initiatives, uh, we reduced the overall cost of a Australian University bachelor's degree by about 45%. We lowered undergraduate tuition, and we also implemented what's called the Australian University Graduation Fund, which allows a student the opportunity to earn their entire senior year essentially at no cost. So the combination of lower tuition, 20% lower tuition, and essentially only paying for three of your four years of college collectively, again, that brought the cost of our bachelor's degree down by just under uh, 50%. And we feel like that was a major turning point for us. We did that in late 2013. We've grown new students every year since for the last uh, three consecutive years. Um, secondly, we've put a lot of effort into understanding how students learn, uh, we use a lot of predictive analytics. We invented this concept of relative student engagement. So a lot of institutions are measuring student engagement. Um, to my knowledge, we're the only institution that uses this tool. So every single night, we rate everybody's level of engagement via several proprietary algorithms that we do. And then every night, we look at the change in engagement. So we know the absolute level of engagement. What we're really interested in are students getting more engaged or less engaged as they go through. We take every student, all 45,000 students, change in engagement, we force that into a bell curve. So by definition, there's gonna be winners and losers, so to speak. We say to every faculty member, here was your level of engagement when you inherited this class at the start of the term. It's fine if it doesn't move, it just can't go down. And so the combination of force ranking every student's engagement level combined with a mandate amongst our faculty to not be an engagement destroyer, if you will, has dramatically improved student engagement. So we've had essentially three consecutive years now of increase, year-over-year -year increases in student achievement and retention. And by achievement, I mean essentially proxy graduation. You're either on track to graduate or you're not at any moment in time, and that forward-looking proxy graduation rate for most of our undergraduate students has nearly doubled inside of three years. We were the first in the country to partner with a large company to offer free college education. So we have this arrangement with uh, Fiat Chrysler Automotive where they're participating US dealers. There's 2,200 of those. If you're a participating dealer, the employees of your dealership can attend Strayer University and get either an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, or a master's degree totally free. There's no tuition, there's no books. Uh, a year ago, we expanded that program to allow immediate family members. So now, in addition to the employee having the opportunity to earn a no-cost, no-debt degree, all immediate family members can. So if you're a service technician, as an example, and you've got five kids, you could put all of your children through this program, and none of them will ever have to pay any tuition. And we think that it could be a role model for how higher education is packaged with companies and delivered moving forward. This is one where, this is recent, it's one where quite proud of, we, we're using the phrase binge learning. So anybody that's been around online learning knows that most of online learning sucks. It's, uh, and by sucks, I mean it's boring, it's dated, 
It's not relevant. I've, I like to say internally that most online learning is a competitor to Ambien, and it's very difficult for students to want to learn. We've had so much innovation in adaptive learning. We've had so much innovation in predictive analytics. None of that can take root if the student isn't interacting with the material. And so we just asked ourselves a simple question, why can't learning be as exciting as watching Netflix, essentially? Why can't we challenge our academic designers, our instructional designers to build content that people can't wait to get in to see? And so within the last year, we've stood up our own internal production studio. We hired a couple executive producers. We've hired a team of filmmakers. We have screenwriters. We paired those individuals with our instructional designers to redefine with it what an online course even is. Today, when you log into one of our online courses, instead of watching a talking head, essentially, because that's what online learning really is, just filming offline learning and showing it on a screen, we're using nonfiction documentary storytelling. And that's woven through all of our classes. And we've seen 1,000 basis point plus gains in participation rates, attendance rates, and completion rates. And our goal over the next year is to have all of our highest volume courses, so 20 courses in all, remade into this studio format. Because if you're not, again, interacting with the material, there's really very hope that you're going to ultimately complete your degree. And by the way, online learning is the future. Like, we should just put that debate to rest. It's inconceivable to me that as a society we're gonna be less digital in five years or less digital in 10 years. So for institutions that aren't willing to embrace online learning as being a major force in how students learn in five and 10 years, you're gonna be way behind the curve. And we just wanted to carve out a place and just say that we wanna be known for really highly produced, engaging, relative content. We're redefining the MBA. And we have two really interesting ones. The first one is Jack Welch. We're the home of Jack Welch's business school, the Jack Welch Management Institute. We acquired it with Jack about four years ago. Uh, when we acquired it, it had less than 50 students. I think it had about 35 students. Today, a little less than four years later, we're closing in on 1,700 students. It's a phenomenal program. It's got among the highest MPS scores that we've seen anywhere. The MPS score is about 88%. It was just named uh, one of the top 25 global online MBA programs by the Princeton Review. And so to our knowledge, that's the fastest ever from inception, creation essentially, to global top 25 ranking, about three and a half years. Uh, and the other MBA that we're just launching is an MBA in digital entrepreneurship in partnership with Cheddar. You may not know Cheddar yet, but Cheddar is an organization founded by a guy named John Steinberg, who's the former president and COO of BuzzFeed. He was the CEO of Daily Mail, the UK media company. He started Cheddar, which is an over-the-top, uh, post-cable media network focused on business for millennials, essentially. Um, he's got partnerships with Sling and DirecTV, Amazon uh, Prime and others. Uh, trying to bring relevant business news to the younger generation without cable networks. He already has more viewers than CNBC on a daily basis. He's partnered with us to create this new MBA program for digital entrepreneurs. Um, and when we say partner, he's the primary guest lecturer. So in both the case of JWMI, Jack, and in the case of uh, John Steinberg, you're learning from people who have you know, practiced what, they've, uh, what they're teaching in real life. And that's part of our DNA. We want our students to learn from experts in their field, and these are uh, two great examples of that on the MBA front. We're using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to scale our best professors. And uh, we've run this test now for a couple of terms where we had a professor who had a significant amount of experience teaching this particular course. This particular professor uh, knew that we were going to run this pilot where we were going to see how many students we could have this professor teach without sacrificing outcomes and quality and learning. Um, and in preparation for this, this particular faculty member pre-recorded 2,000 videos for feedback going to students from any conceivable type of feedback that a professor would have to give a student. These are relatively short videos, so anywhere from 30 to 90 seconds. But having recorded all of that feedback, 
um, now when students are interacting with the material and they're submitting an assignment or they're responding to a question that this particular professor would ask, a machine or artificial intelligence can say, oh, that needs feedback video number 205, let me send that to this student. So in nearly real time, the students are getting personalized feedback from their professor. Um, and what's interesting is we ran the first pilot where the uh, professor went from teaching a normal section of about 30 students to 600. And the section with 600 outperformed all the other sections of that class, but also that professor's section of 30 students. So we got higher outcomes with 600 students than we did it at 30, and now we're getting ready to test that in probably, Brian, it ended up being more than 1,500 students in our next term. So as long as we're able to get superior outcomes, which we've had, we're willing to test the limits to see how many students can learn from this uh, engaging format. Um, this is right on the cusp of what we're doing now. Uh, we have, again, 350 relationships with Fortune 1000 companies. Our Degrees at Work program with FCA, we saw as a really unique opportunity to bring affordability in a major way to companies and their employees. The idea here is you focus on high school graduates. So what you do is essentially you partner with a company and you say hire 100 students from you know, your community give them an entry level, full-time job, but agree to only work that employee roughly 30 hours a week. You're gonna pay them for 40, they're only gonna work 30. In the remaining 10, they're gonna to go to school with us. And in the remaining 10 hours, they're gonna get personalized and customized instructions, probably en route to an associate's degree. But that associate's degree will be packaged with life skills, so smart borrowing, smart use of credit, financial literacy, growth mindset type uh, courseware so that self-confidence can begin to be built. Again, these are 18, 19 year olds. So in two years, you'll get an associate's degree that's been paid for by your company. You've got two years of full-time work experience. You've got hopefully new life skills. And our view is that we'll be able to offer this for the equivalent of less than a $2 per hour premium. So if you were gonna pay the person $8 an hour, as a normal wage, you can instead pay them $10 an hour and get this program in mass at scale. Uh, and we're actively talking to several large US cities who've expressed an interest in this and about a half dozen Fortune 100 companies. And we hope to have additional announcements on this uh, shortly. And then uh, lastly, and perhaps the thing that we're uh, most proud of is there was some research that came out of uh, Stanford University within the last year. And what these particular researchers were looking at is how effective are colleges at generating economic mobility? And specifically, how effective are institutions at taking students from the bottom quintiles of US income distribution and moving them up to the top quintiles of income distribution? And to do that, they looked at two axes of data, essentially. One is an individual college's success rate. So just given any particular student, how successful are you at moving people up the income quintiles in the United States? And as an example, Harvard would rank very high on success rate, but Harvard actually scores very low on the other metric, which is accessibility, because Harvard admits very few students from the bottom quintile of income in the United States. And so these researchers posited that the best way that you can measure an institution is to take the product of the success rate and the access rate, essentially controlling for both. And they published their research again within the last year. The New York Times wrote a story on it. And when you look at that new measure, which I believe they call mobility rate, which is the product of success versus accessibility, Strayer University scores better than 92% of all colleges and institutions in the United States meaning we have a very high success rate at moving people up through the income quintiles, but we also admit a fair amount of students given our, our history as an open access institution. And this is a measure that we very much root our own definition of success in. We're not satisfied with merely graduation or completion rates. We wanna make sure that our students are earning a substantial or tangible return on their educational investment and moving people up through the income distribution in the country uh, relative to where they started is a big part of that and how we think about measuring it. And again, those are, are just eight brief examples of the things that we're focused on. 
Everything that we're focused on, again, is designed to make an impact, uh, move higher education forward. We certainly uh, don't have a view that we're the best or that others aren't doing great things because we know very much that that's the case. But we are proud of the positive impact that we're having and uh, we're gonna challenge ourselves to get better and better in the years ahead. And uh, if there are questions, I'd be happy to take any. Hi, uh, you talked about um, making the content particularly engaging by leveraging story writers and could you go a little bit more into detail about that? It sounds really interesting, but just wondering how that comes through in still teaching the material, but weaving in aspects of entertainment or those Yeah, versions. well, th um, think of the Ken Burns Civil War documentary. More books were sold in the Civil War following that documentary than in the history of education because it was riveting. So here's a good example. We teach introductory English, English 115, I think is the number. And we found this um, fellow up in New York who was wrongly convicted of murder. And he was incarcerated for more than 25 years. And he was quasi-illiterate when he was convicted. Taught himself to read, taught himself to write, learned how to write legal briefs, started filing legal briefs on his own behalf. Ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled another case in such a way that forced a hearing in his case from a precedent standpoint. And as a result of that, he was freed. The hearing deemed that evidence was withheld. And the lesson that we glean from that particular story is one, writing really matters. And you, know, you can learn to be a good writer. And what we wanna do is take traditional subjects, be it English or computer science, mathematics, and tell that in an interesting way merely to get you hooked, so to speak, so that you come back and learn more. Because underpending all of our classes are really powerful adaptive learning engines. We've gotten good enough at remediating math, as an example, that if you give us 20 hours a week, we can almost remediate anyone's math from these adaptive learning platforms. The problem is students weren't getting in and interacting enough. So we said, you know, who's really good at storytelling? Filmmakers. So we hired an army of filmmakers and paired them with our faculty and paired them with our instructional designers and the, res the results have been pretty, pretty good. And we should, Brian, put an example or two maybe on our YouTube channel so that people can get a, a glimpse from what these stories look like. Yes, sir. Um, you cut the uh, undergraduate tuition by 50% and I'm, I suppose, uh, interested to know more about how you, how you did that if your investor, investors were patient with that, if it was just a supply side thing where you were hoping it, it, Roland would fill in? Um, we, the, it was about 45% reduction. Half of that reduction comes from the graduation fund. So the actual reduction in tuition was 20%, which does mean we had a 20% reduction in revenue per student. Um, part of the way we enabled that is we took out a pretty large chunk of expenses at the end of 2013, about $50 million, so we had to get to a lower cost base. Um, and part of the way that we did it is we just had more demand. We were shrinking new students when we implemented the lower tuition. We've grown them every year since. Uh, it took about three years for the lower revenue per student to work its way through our income statement. So now you have a situation where revenue trails enrollment pretty much in line. If we get a 5% increase in enrollment, we should get a 5% increase in revenue, barring any tuition changes. Prior to that, we were growing enrollment and our revenue was still shrinking because we had reduced the tuition. It took us three years to work through that. Um, uh, to answer your other question, we have a very patient uh, investor base, I think. We have very low turnover amongst our shareholders. Um, we didn't. We didn't counsel them. We thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, we've always said that Strayer's been around 126 years. The best way to have a good business is to have a good university first. And our experience has been the only way you can really ensure that is if you take a long-term view and not really manage quarter to quarter. If you do that, our experience has kind of shown that it's not gonna work. So we, we think in years and decades, really. Yes, sir. Thank you. You mentioned the repetition of the, the feedback from the instructor, being able to kind of scale and have better outcomes. Can you speak a little bit more about the scalability of that and that one-to-one -one connection being able to, to help the outcomes be even better improved? 
Well, as long as um, today the way we did that is a human being had to predict all the feedback that a student would need. And this was based on you know, years of teaching a particular subject. I can imagine in the future, as artificial intelligence gets more embedded in classes, that engine will also glean feedback that should be given to a student. Uh, but in the tests that we ran, uh, all the feedback is video, A. That in and of itself is an enormous difference maker. Students' receptiveness to video feedback is far greater than written feedback. Um, but most professors aren't willing to devote the time that's needed to give every single student a video feedback lecture every time. It's really hard work. Um, which is why what we do when we're you know, hiring faculty members is we put them through a video audition now. We won't hire a professor if they don't have good video presence because it, it, in an online world, that really matters. Um, so it's just a question of how effectively can you match the feedback to the student and how personalized that feedback can be because the more personalized, the better. And my guess is what we're gonna learn is it's gonna be some combination of AI learning stuff that we couldn't combine with the professor's own expertise coming together to say, Brian, you need to do these three things differently. And we're gonna tell Brian he needs to do those three things differently within five minutes of Brian having submitted the thing. And the only reason it's five minutes is because we, we had to slow it down to five minutes because it could have been 20 milliseconds. But if it's 20 milliseconds, the student's gonna be like, and it's gonna be right back at them and then it's not gonna, it's gonna feel weird. Uh, and we want it to be authentic. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to piggyback a bit on this gentleman's question about um, nonfiction documentary storytelling. You talked about how some KPIs increased, um, what yep. I would call engagement yeah. KPIs. Yep. Um, would you talk a little bit more about what those were, sure. how much they sure. increased? So the, the course metrics we track are attendance. And our definition of attendance is what are the number of sessions you attended versus the possible attendance sessions? Just that ratio, whatever it is. We track the percentage of students who are in good standing at the midterm. We track how many students completed their course. And the most important metric that we track is the percentage of credit hours that are earned vis-a-vis -vis the credit hours that were attempted. And every metric went up, and order of magnitude the, the Chicha metric, that's our nickname for credit hours earned over credit hours attempted, uh, was roughly seven to 900 basis points of gain from a controlled course that didn't have these improvements. So it was substantial. And it was one of those things that just stood to reason. Like, there's no way you could look at one of our new courses and one of our old courses and say, this one's gonna be better. It was just embarrassing how bad our old courses were. Um, so and we got those gains in a couple of sections of a test. Now that we're gonna be rolling it out in mass, by the end of this year, more than 15,000 students will have gone through these new courses. It's gonna have a major impact on, on completion rates, graduation rates, and success. Student confidence, they're just, they're just much better courses. Probably have time for one more if there is one. Brian and I don't normally sport facial hair. But there's a very important hockey series going on. This is an NHL playoff beard. Brian has one too. Our Washington Capitals are playing the Pittsburgh Penguins tonight. <laughs> if they lose, we will be clean shaven tomorrow. If they win, we'll stop. We'll, we'll shave for another series or so. But uh, thank you all very much. Appreciate your interest in Strayer and uh, enjoy the conference.